All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out to the very last session of the, of the conference. Tips and tricks for creating custom manager packs for Microsoft System Center Operations Manager, which is a super long title. So I'm Mickey Gousset. I'm a principal consultant at Infront Consulting Group, and I'll be your guide through the next 75 minutes. So we're all, we've already talked about a little bit about, um, I was asking in a little pre-warm-up, who's built manager packs, who haven't. We've had some more people come in, so let's do, do it one more time. How many people in here have built a management pack? Awesome. How many people in here have done it with an authoring tool other than the operations console? Awesome. So we've got people in here that have not built any kind of management packs to people that have built some super advanced management packs. So the point of today's session is to cover some of the, the different tips and tricks and things to think about when you're building management packs from both very basic ideas up to even more advanced ideas. And in fact, I've got a slide at the end that shows you that at the end of this session, you should have picked up about 22 different tips or tricks. For those of you that have been building management packs, some of you may know these, know these. For those of you that haven't, obviously you won't, but now you will. As I mentioned before, I'm a developer living in an IT pro world, and it's actually kind of cool. Now, I've been doing, building management packs for about four years now. I also teach a class on it. So we've got a four-day class on management pack development that I wrote and that I teach. So I'm trying to take some things from that and condense this into 75 minutes. So we're going to go pretty darn fast. I, send, I tend to talk really fast. But the good news is there's nobody coming up after me, so we can answer questions as long as you want to. So here's the agenda that we're going to follow. We're going to do a basic introduction to management pack structure just to kind of get us all on the same page and, and make sure you know, we all understand what a management pack is. We're going to talk about some of the things you can use for building these management packs. And then we're going to jump into three sections, basic, advanced, and expert tips. I've got some demos for all three sections. Um, one of the things you have to remember with the demos is we're at the mercy of operations manager sometimes once you import it when it decides to actually start, you know, kick off the monitoring. So to get around some of that, I'm going to use the MP simulator to simulate some of these workflows as opposed to just importing them in operations manager and kind of show you how that works as well and how you can use that. But we are going to do some importing in ops manager and I've got everything running on my trusty, you know, laptop here, which means it's going to be super fast. So just, you have to bear with me if there is some time or some, you know, we do have to do a little bit of, bit of waiting or clicking and coming back. And that's what I wanted to tell you. So let's move on to talking about what is a management pack. So a management pack is how you add functionality into operations manager. It's also how you add functionality into service manager. And it's very core, a management pack is an XML file. That's all it is. It's a bunch of XML. And the, the goal of, of writing manager packs is to build classes, which are the things we want to monitor. Then we have to go discover those monitors, then we, or discover those classes. Then we write the unit monitors or the rules for being able to track to see if those classes are in a healthy state. And it used to be with the Arthur and console, you could get away with not necessarily having to work with the XML that, what, that much, but with the new tools, you're, you're going to get your hands dirty with the XML, and we're going to see that today. So we're going to be using Visual Studio today, but don't, so, but don't stress out. Now, when we talk management packs, though, there's another thing you need to know. There's two types of management packs, sealed and unsealed. An unsealed management pack has a .xml extension. It's a text file. It's an XML file. You can open that up in your favorite text editor. How many people in here use Notepad++? Rock on. That is my favorite text editor currently. Um, and you can edit it and, you know, work with it. A sealed management pack, though, is a XML file that you basically turn into a binary. It's got a .mp file in it. So most of the management packs that you download from third parties, that you download from Microsoft, those are sealed management packs. The reason they're sealed is so that you can't directly change directly the functionality of that management pack. Now, you can create overrides on that management pack, which allow you to change things like thresholds or whatever the management pack Arthur has allowed you to change. And I'm going to show you how you, can, how you can do that in your own custom management packs. But you can't change the core functionality. So most times when you buy a manager pack, it's going to be sealed. And I'm going to show you how you seal a manager pack. It's super duper easy. It takes like less than five seconds. So where do you go? F okay, so here's the thing, right? 
you're building management packs. Why do you want to build your own management pack? Anybody? Why would you want to build your own management pack? So, 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 yes, basically you've got something you want to monitor and either there's not a management pack out there that does it or your company doesn't want to pay for the management pack that does do it. So how do you find out whether there's a management pack already out there for you to use? Well, that's your first tip. You go to Pinpoint, pinpoint.microsoft.com. How many people have gone to Pinpoint? Pinpoint's where you can go search for all the, mic mic the management packs that are out there, both from Microsoft and third parties, and you can download those management packs. So that's a great place to go to, to, to see what management packs are available. It's also a good place to go to find other resources around training and consulting and things like that. Or I can just give you my card. That's a whole other story. So, we're talking management packs. So let's flip over here. I have blown up my fonts in Visual Studio to make it easier for you to see. Therefore, it makes it harder for me to navigate, so please bear with me. To build, we're going to build a new management pack real quick from scratch. And I'm going to do it using the Visual Studio R3 extensions. So the way you build SCOM 2012 management packs if you want to take use of all the functionality of SCOM 2012, is you have to use the, either the, the Visio extensions, or the, and we'll talk more about that in a second, or the Visual Studio R3 extensions. So I'm using the Visual Studio R3 extensions. Right now, they only support 2010. So 2012 support is coming. All I was told was it's coming. I've been asking for three days. So. But, so we have to use Visual Studio 2010. But when you install the R3 extensions, and you say, well, I'm just going to create a new project, and a project is essentially a management pack, is what it amounts to, then you have the ability to say, I want to build a, two, a, a SCOM 2012 management pack, or I want to build a management pack that only supports 2007. So we're going to build a SCOM 2012 management pack, and we'll call this Demo one, because we can. Now, what's going to happen is, here's the thing. The way management packs get built now in the Visual Studio tool, and this is not a Visual Studio tool talk, but I am going to give you tips on how to use it, because you are going to be using it, is you actually don't build just one big XML file anymore. You build fragments of XML. So you only build the XML that you care about, and then once you've got the XML that you care about, it kind of puts it all together magically in the right order for you. And it also does some things like um, create, a, it can do a lot of code generation for you, a lot of code creation for you. Now, what you're going to notice here is I do have a, a new tab called Management Pack Browser, which if you're used to using the Arthuring console, it's got a very similar look to the Arthuring console. So I've got the ability to see the service model information, classes and relationships. I've got the ability to see the health model information, the rules and discoveries that are in my, my, man, my pack that I'm creating. So I point this out to you so that you're aware of it, because a lot of people aren't aware this is there. So that's another tip. You've got the management pack browser. Now, just, let's just add a quick class, and then we're going to build this, and I'm going to show you what the actual final code looks like. So what I can do is I can right-click on my project, and I can say I'm going to add a new item here. And that's going to give me this whole list of stuff. So I could create an agent task. I could create a class. I could create a discovery. I could create monitors, rules. So if I want to create a class, I'm going to create a class. And we'll call this my custom class. And you'll notice that it's got a .mpx file. That's for, it's a management pack fragment. But when you open this up, this class is going to now be an XML file. So I don't have the in, like I did in the authoring console, the pretty little necessarily GUI for filling this out. What I have instead is the XML that defines a class in SCOM. So you're, but the next question you're going to ask is, well, how the heck am I supposed to know the order that I'm supposed to put all this stuff in? That's where you've got to go do a little research. You've got to go to the management pack wiki. You've got to go, I've got some links at the end of the slide deck to help you do that. However, one of the things that you do get by using, Intelli um, in, by using Visual Studio is, let me, no, it's not broken. It's just slow because of my machine. You get IntelliSense. So Visual Studio knows the schema behind the management pack. 
So as you try to do different things like add new tags or add new attributes, it's going to use IntelliSense to prompt you to tell you what to enter. So in this case, I wanted to change this to be a local application class. And it was able to prompt up the different options I had based off of the Microsoft.Windows. And I know since it's local application, I need to set this to true. Now, the reason, reason I know that is because if I don't set it to true and I try to build it, it'll actually error out. And it'll tell me, hey, that's supposed to be set to true. So, so you're going to come in here, and we're going to keep doing this. You're going to add new files. You're going to add new whatever stuff to your manager pack. If we right-click on our, our Demo 1 project, which is going to be our Demo 1 manager pack, and go to Properties, there's some properties you need to be aware of as well. Which are, this is where you can set the manager pack ID and the initial version number. You can have it automatically seal your manager pack for you when you build it. And sealing a manager pack is as simple as saying, all right, let me go find a key. So I used sn.exe from the Windows SDK, and I created a key. Let me go find that key, and we'll link that key in here. So we'll go to workspaces. There's my tech ed key. I can connect this up to a management group to where I can auto-deploy, as soon as I build this thing, automatically deploy it off onto, say, my test SCOM server. So saving you that extra step of having to do the build, of having to do the import. And I can have it auto-increment the version number for me. I'm torn on that. I like to, to own when I increment the version number personally. But if you're going to be auto-deploying into SCOM, then you should have it auto-increment the version number so that you're always up in the version number before you send it into SCOM. So you have those different options that you're going to want to set at your manager pack level. But ultimately, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to build this thing. And when you build this thing, what it, it's going to go in, it's going to go all your different manager pack fragments, and it's going to verify that everything will be put together the way it's supposed to be put together. And it does an MP verify on it. And ultimately, we're going to get one file out of this called demo1.xml. And demo1.xml is going to be our management pack. We're also going to get a demo1.mp. And why are we going to get a demo1.mp? Because I sealed it. Exactly. And we even get a demo1.mpb file. Anybody in here know what a .mpb file is? Hmm? Bundle. <laughs> management pack bundle, exactly. Which is basically a way of taking your management pack and bundling in any other DLLs or any other images or anything you may want, and then you just import that one file. You'll notice it succeeded. So let's right-click on this, and let's go to Properties. Or not Properties, sorry. Right-click on this and go to Open Folder. And if we go to the bin debug folder, there's my XML file. If I right-click on that and open it with Notepad, then here's what an actual XML file of a manager pack looks like, right? We've got a manifest section where you specify the ID value of your, of your, of your manager pack. Now, one thing to remember, if you start editing XML by hand, to, this XML file by hand, two things. Those changes don't go back into Visual Studio. So it's not a two-way street. But also, if you change the ID value, the ID value has to match the file name of your management pack. That is a rule. So if you change the ID value to be something other than the file name of your manager pack, you're invalidating the XML and it's not going to be able to import. You can specify the version number. You can specify references to other management packs that you're going to use. And then you can see here's where we've declared our class. So it took that fragment and it's imported into that, into, into, um, put it all into this one file. And then we've got the display strings, which are what we use to actually display um, when you display fields inside of Operations Manager, that's where those things are going to get displayed. Basic, basic manager pack. Very, very easy basic manager pack. So, sometimes though, another tip, the easiest way I've found to learn how to build a manager pack is to look at the manager packs that have already been built. Here's the problem. Manager packs that you get from Microsoft are sealed. How are you supposed to look at them? Well, you got a couple of options, one of which is there's a, a, a application out there called MP Viewer that you could download and you could open up those manager packs. But another, but the problem is I can't just right click on a manager pack and export it. And even if I could, I can't open it. Why? It's sealed. See, you're listening. Awesome. So how do you get around that? Well, let me show you how you get around that. 
you come out to your favorite little PowerShell window, right? And you run, if you run git sc management pack, that gives you a list of all the management packs that are inside your operations manager at that point. So now if you run, so let's go make a directory, and we'll call it mp ed. So now if I run that PowerShell command, but then I pipe it into export sc management pack, and I say path c colon backslash mp ed. What that does is it takes all those manager packs that the git, git, git grabs and exports them out, and it exports them out as unsealed manager packs. So you can come in here and we can go, let's go back to here, and there's our, wait, one more. You can see it's exporting all these manager packs. And let's come out, let's say, to the data warehouse library manager pack and open that in Notepad. And you open the, one, of, one of these manager packs up in Notepad, and then you can really start to see some of the different structure that's available. And this file's a little big, so it takes it just a second to come out, plus it may still be exporting. Yep, nope, it's done. But what we've got is we've got a manifest section. We've got a type section where we can defer, declare our class types, our relationship types. You've got monitoring rules. You've got monitors. You've got overrides. You've got presentation information. You've got report information. Management packs could get really big when you're editing the XML. And this was a, a big deal back before Visual Studio because usually you had one big XML file or you broke your management packs up into multiple files, which you can still do with Visual Studio. But sometimes it's very hard to find what you want. But now with Visual Studio, we can actually, um, by using these management pack fragments, we can use folders, we can break things off and, and put things you know, pretty much exactly where we want them. So, I rec so you've got the PowerShell exports you can use to look at any management pack and to help you understand how you're going to build these things. So the next question that leads to, and before I do that, let's come out here. So let me close this solution. And let me op start the second one opening. I got wise this year and pre-created everything. That's not the one I want. There we go. Discovery 2. Now, there we go. How do you build these things? So, SCOM 2012. How many people in here are using SCOM 2012? How many people are using SCOM 2007? Awesome. So you can use the Visual Studio Authoring extensions to build 2007 or 2012 management packs. If you're building just, you can also use the authoring console, the 2007 authoring console, which is a download from Microsoft, it can build 2007 management packs. It's a more visual tool than Visual Studio. It's got wizards. It's got GUIs. But it can only build 2007 management packs, and it's not going to be upgraded, ever. It's, it's, it's there. It's supported, but it's not going to be upgraded. So you're going to have to come to the realm of Visual Studio sooner or later. Now, you can also use Visio. How many people in here have used the Visio? What was your experience with the Visio? All right, he says he didn't like it. One other person, what was your experience with the Visio? Oh, how many people, who else used the Visio? I didn't like it either. Okay. It is, it is limited. It's designed for making very basic management packs. If you just need to make a basic monitor, basic service monitor, basic whatever, you can use the Visio, um, the Visio plugin for doing that. You can also use the Operations Console. How many people here use the templates in the Operations Console? Yeah. So you can use the Operations Console. But if you're really going to build management packs to monitor those custom applications that you're building, you're going to use the Visual Studio 2010 authoring extensions. You're also, at some point, every once in a while, going to use a text editor. I like Notepad++, personally. And there is support coming soon for Visual Studio 2012. So what we're using today, like I said, is mostly going to be the Visual, is Visual Studio 2010. So let's talk some of our basic tips and tricks that I want to give you. So we're going to talk targeting. We're going to talk version control. We're going to talk discovery scripts, how you debug those scripts, why you're going to like Visual Studio for debugging those scripts, and 
a little bit about customizing rules and monitors, which takes us into some, some more advanced topics. So the first thing you need to know when you're building your, your discoveries. So discoveries go out and find the classes we want to monitor. Um, and then rules and monitors, you know, monitor those things. We have to target our rules and monitors and target our discoveries at, the, at whatever object we want to monitor. And this is particularly important from a discovery standpoint. So let's walk through a quick targeting example. We want to monitor all the failed logon attempts on Windows computers in our organization. So I've got a monitor that wants to monitor all the failed logon attempts on Windows computers in our organization. What should I target that monitor at? Well, but now I want to, what class? Well, it, let's see. Good examples. Windows operating system. Why Windows operating system? Because logging into something is a function of the operating system. So if I target at Windows operating system, that means all, all clients, all, desktop, all desktops, all servers in my organization will be monitored by that monitor. If I just want um, servers, I could target Windows server operating system. So I'm getting more specific. I only care about the failed logins on servers. Or if I only cared about server 2012, then I, I target server 2012. So part of when you're building these manager packs is you've got to figure out your monitoring scenario, what you're wanting to monitor, and make sure you target as specific as possible. Why is that important? It's important because if I only care about logins on the servers, but I target Windows operating system, then I'm going to get all this information from the clients that I don't care about. Right? So you want to, you want to target as specific as possible. Bad, bad things to do. Don't ever target the agent. Targeting the agent, unless you've got a monitor for the agent, but targeting the agent in this scenario is not a good idea. Because what if you've got computers that don't have agents on them? Then they're not going to get monitored. So some people think, oh, I'll just target the agent. Well, if you don't have agents everywhere, that doesn't help you. Don't target just the generic computer class. Anybody have an idea why? What if it's not a Windows machine? What if it's a Linux machine? What if it's, you know, it's, again, things you need to consider. So you, you want to target as specific as you possibly can. Targeting is very, very important. So here's an example of the, the operating system model hierarchy in Operations Manager. Now here's the thing. If you target a node on this chart right here, it's going to also target anything below that node. So if you target Windows operating system, then that monitor is going to go out to all Windows operating systems, which includes both 2012 operating system and 2008. Whereas if I target just Windows server operating system, it only goes to the servers and not the clients. So you've got to know what you're wanting to target. So I want to throw this out there real quick. I'll take questions at the end, so, but I get on the roll. So, <laughs> you got, But you've got to know what you want to target. Targeting is super important. I bang targeting into people's heads in my class, and I think I've done it here, so we'll move on. Next thing to consider from a basic tip and trick perspective, version control. Building management packs is building software. You are writing code. You are building something. And as such, you need to have a way of tracking what you're building and rolling back if something bad happens. So you need some sort of application lifecycle management in place to make this happen. Now, what do you use? That's up to you. Microsoft has Team Foundation Server. They also have Team Foundation Service, which is the cloud-based version of Team Foundation Server, which is very easy to use. And because you're using Visual Studio to build these management packs, it's very easy. It integrates in with Team Explorer, and it just check in and check out. It works great. But you've got to have some sort of version control in place. Even if it's a poor man's version control, where you're keeping things in different folders, at least you're doing something. But if you don't have some way of tracking your, ver of tracking your changes, then you're going to get bitten because you're going to make a change and then you're going to want to roll back and you're not going to be able to. So targeting is important. Version control is important. So let's talk discoveries. There are multiple ways. So we're going to build these classes, right? You saw me build a class. Before we can monitor the class, we've got to... 
Discover the class. Yeah, the slide's a little bit of a giveaway. So how do we go about discovering classes in Operations Manager? Well, the best way, registry. There's a regedit discovery. Go look, or not regedit, but there's a registry discovery. Go look in your registry. That's fast. That's quick. It works. You can also do things like WMI queries if you want to. Worst case, if, if the registry discovery doesn't work, you can use, or the other discovery options don't work, you can use a script, VB script, PowerShell. I'm, I'm still old school VB scripts, so that's what my examples are in. The thing with a script to remember is a script is super powerful. You can do anything with a script. A script is also more resource intensive than just a registry check. So script discovery should also be your last thing you try. But if you're going to do script discoveries, you're going to want to be able to test them. The thing about script discoveries, they're all the same. It's 90% the same, which is the first thing I need to do is I need to have, I need to create an object, a script API object. And notice it's called mom API. But, you know, it, and so you create a script API object. And then you create a discovery data object. Now, that discovery data object has three parameters, a zero. It's always a zero, will always be a zero. You just put a zero and move on. It's a, that's a throwback from mom 2005. And then it has a source ID and a managed entity ID. The source ID is a value that you've passed into your script that is the GUID value of the workflow that's running. It's the GUID value of the discovery that's running right then. I'll show you how you pass that in. And then there's the managed entity ID which is what you've targeted. It's the, 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 the server that you've targeted, or the computer that you've targeted, or the class that you've targeted. So you're going to create these two objects. Then, right here, where I don't have any code, you're going to put your logic. That's your logic of, I go check this INI file and see if a server's installed. or I, Whatever I'm doing to determine if this class exists on this machine. If it exists, or whether it exists or not, I create a discovery instance of that class. So I take my discovery object, I say create class instance, and I take the class name that, of whatever class I'm wanting to build. I set any properties on that class by saying class name slash property to whatever value. And I add that class to my discovery as an instance. And then finally, I return that discovery value, that discovery object. So I've got all this, then you can cut and paste this, and you've built most of your discovery script at that point. You just got to add in your business logic as far as what you're wanting to discover. Now, here's some tips around discovery scripts that some people don't know. You need to always return that discovery object, even if it's empty. Always. Otherwise, you're going to see errors in your event log, and things aren't going to work correctly. And you always return it because that's how SCOM knows if something doesn't exist anymore. So let's say I go out to a computer and I discover an application, and then the next day, you uninstall that application. The way SCOM knows that that application isn't there is the next day that discovery runs, it doesn't find that application there anymore because you returned a blank discovery object, and so it goes and removes it from SCOM. So you always return a, blank, a, a discovery object whether it has values in it or not. You always want to target as specifically as you can, and then you want to figure out, how am I going to debug these scripts? We've got two ways to debug scripts. One of which is, the old school way, is you can use the log script event method. And the log script event method writes out to the operations manager event log. And that, that allows you to write out um, events to that event log so you can see what's happening in your script as it runs. You're going to see, I'm going to show you what I tend to do, is I include these in all my scripts, and I include a way to turn them on and off. So that by default, they're off, but then if I'm encountering a production issue, I can, just, I can turn on my logging, and it starts writing out to the event log so I can see what's happening in, with this production issue. The second thing you can do when you're building your monitoring is you can actually use the MP simulator to step through your script. And this is so freaking cool, because you're using Visual Studio. So that means you can pick breakpoints. You can, jump, you can put breakpoints. I can see the stack. I can see the values of variables. This, I mean, it's, it's, it makes debugging scripts much, much easier. So let's look at a couple of examples.
Now, oh, almost did it. Almost started talking without flipping the, the monitor. So I'm building a, I've got a discovery here that goes out and looks in an INI file for a value. That's all it's doing. And it's a script discovery. So let me show you what I've done here in Visual Studio is I've actually created a scripts folder. And with my scripts folder, that's where I've got my VB script, or PowerShell, or whatever you want to do. But if I open up my VB script, then I get all the nice little color coding that I would expect. And all this script is doing, just to break it down for you very quickly, is I'm passing in, creating my mom API object. I'm passing in three arguments. Those three arguments are the same three arguments you will always pass in to every discovery you make, which is the source ID, the managed entity ID, and the, and the target computer that we're running against. And then all this script is doing is it says, it says, hey, go out to the acme.ini file. And you can look at this. I've got this online. Open up that INI file. Create our discovery object. Open up that INI file and see if we find a line that says, is Acme server equal one? And if we do, we know that we've got the Acme server software installed and we want to create a discovery object. So you can see what we're doing here is we're saying, call log script event. I'm creating a class instance of my Acme class. And I'm adding a couple of properties. I'm setting both the principal name and the display name of the Acme class. I'm setting the instance and I'm returning the data. And I'm stopping the script. You'll also know, though, notice that I'm return also returning an empty discovery data so that if I don't find this thing, it removes it from SCOM as well. So after that, I've got my class here that I created earlier, same kind of class that we created earlier. I need to create my discovery. So this is where things are a little different in um, Visual Studio because what happens is to create discoveries, you do a combination of modifying things in the properties window and writing some XML, and then it dynamically generates the code for you. So what I did is I, I, write, I created a new dis what's called a discovery template group. And I've got only one discovery in my discovery template group. But what you do is you, you come in here and you can say, I'm going to add a new template, and you can pick the type of discovery you want to create. And then you have to start filling out the properties over here on the right-hand side. Now, here's another tip. I always start from the bottom of the property window and work my way up because it makes more sense to me. So for example, I've got to specify my target. And my target in this case is Windows operating system. Now, again, I've got a little, pretty little button I can push so I can go in and specify what I want to target. True, set the name, set the display name. I've got to specify what class I want to discover. So you can say I added my Acme class that I want to discover. And then I need to specify the data source that I want to use for building this discovery. And the data source for building this discovery, in this case, is a time script discovery provider. So if I click this pretty little button here, I can see a list of all the discovery provider options, just data source modules that I have. And the one that I care about is the time script discovery provider. How do I know that? Because I've done this before, and I did some research on MSDN. Or I built this in um, the Arthurian console and then looked at the XML. Whatever you want to do. But I want a time script discovery provider. And then I need to provide the configuration information for triggering that script, or for, for triggering that provider. This is where you've got to know the XML that's required. OK? Now, here's a cool thing, though. So let me cut that. If you don't know the XML, if you just type an open brace, it'll show you the first XML value that it expects, which is interval seconds. And so that would be 60. And then I go to the next line. I type the next brace. And it tells me it expects sync time. So it will kind of walk you through what the tags are that you need. Now, I've already put the tags in here, which are things like, I want this discovery to run every 60 seconds. Here's another tip. In production, you do not want discoveries to run every 60 seconds. Bad idea. Discoveries are intensive. Best practice, you want discoveries to run once a day. Some people run them every 12 hours. Some people run them every four hours. But best practice is you only want them to run once a day, because most times you don't have things changing more than that. And I'm passing in. I'm giving this a script name, and I'm passing in MP element, 
which is uh, the, the, the manage, manage entity ID. I'm passing in target ID, which is going to be that source ID. And you'll notice that these are, have, have dollar signs in front of them. That's how you declare the variables. And then I'm passing in the principal name. So I'm passing in three arc values. But then for script body, I don't, I don't add the script. Instead, I use this include file content keyword. Now, this is cool, and you're, I'm about to show you why it's cool, and, and I get excited very easy, but this is really cool, because it solves one of the major issues I have with the Arthuring console. So what I can do is, you know, I built my script over here in the scripts directory, right? We saw it earlier, believe me? Okay. So I can say include file content, scripts, goes to that scripts folder, and include this script. So when, it, when I build this thing and it generates my manager pack, it's going to go get that script and throw it in here. So hold that thought. And then let's see, was there anything else we set? And that's all we set for the discovery. And then what will happen is, if we added more discoveries, what you can see is you can come down here and actually open up this fragment, and you can see where it auto-generated the code for that discovery. And what's cool about these fragments is I only have the things in that fragment that matter. I don't have all the other XML code for all the other pieces. It's just that particular fragment. But let's do this. Let me open this up and go out here to bin debug. I'm going to delete the values that were there. Let's build this, and then I'm going to show you why I think that include content file is so freaking cool. So we're going to say build solution. And again, with the output window, you can watch and see if the solution's building. We've got the error window down there, so it'll tell us if, if any errors or any warnings that, are, that have occurred. And it's almost done. And we're going to go out and open this up in Notepad. And then we're going to run it. So it built successfully. So I come out here and I go to debug. And I say edit with Notepad++. This right here. In, you have to wrap your VB scripts especially in this C data tag. And that's the best practice, because otherwise, if you don't, then it, it goes in to your script, and it finds things like, let's find one for you, the less than sign, and replaces it with ampersand LT semicolon. Unicodes it. So in the authoring console, the authoring console, the 2007 authoring console had a bad habit of even if you included the C data tags in your script, it would strip them out when you saved the file. Which then when you import that and those things are replaced, your script doesn't work. So if you do your scripting like this, where you have your scripts, where you've created the VBS, the, the, the VBS file and you import it using that include content file, it automatically puts the C data tag there for you and you don't have this problem anymore. So that's just yet another tip that you have. Now how do we go about testing this thing? Well, let's do a couple of different. Well, if you go out to View Manager Pack Browser, and I drill down into the Manager Pack Browser, and I drill down to Discoveries, I can see my different discoveries that are there, and I can right click on my discovery and I can say MP Simulator. How many people in here have used the MP Simulator? What do you think? What do you think? Have you used it with Visual Studio? or with the, with the resource kit. What the simulator allows you to do is simulate the workflow. And so it's going to actually run and simulate the workflow without you having to import it into SCOM and wait for it to be pushed out to an agent and whatever else you're, you're, you're trying to do. Now it takes a second to run. So, and what, if, what you've got here is you've got, it's got both the target expressions that it might need as well as any overridable parameters. And what it's going to do is I click Start Simulation, and it's going to run that discovery. So it's going to run that discovery, and you'll notice it came back. The discovery triggered, and it returned data. So it went out, found that file. That file existed, and it actually says, here's the class I'm going to create, and here are the different values that I'm going to set. So the MP Simulator allows you to 
then this is going to be key because we're going to come back to this. But it allows you to see the data that the different modules are returning. Which, when you start trying to figure out how to build your alert messages, that's awesome. And you'll see why. But I want to debug my scripts, right? Well if, well, if we come out here and go to the event viewer for operations manager, because I ran this in the simulator, it wrote out starting the Acme discovery script. And it wrote out, hey, we found a match. Well, that's great. Uh, that, that helps me somewhat. This is how I used to debug scripts. You put those statements all through your script. It's kind of like doing classic ASP. <laughs> and then you go through and figure out um, what you, what you, you know, where the issue is. But with the MP simulator, let me stop that, we've got a debug scripts option. Check this out. So we're going to start the simulation again. But this time we're going to debug the script, right? So the simulation is going to get keyed up and it's going to go, hey, do you want to debug this script in Visual Studio? Yes, I do want to debug this script in Visual Studio. It puts me in debug mode. Now I'm in Visual Studio in debug mode. I've got all my local variables. I can step line by line and see where things stand. I can come down here to different places and say, you know what, let's put a breakpoint there. And let's put a breakpoint here. And then I can just run until I hit those breakpoints. And it runs those the breakpoints. And I'm able to look and see, oh, look, the input line was is Acme Server 1. I'm reading from this file. This is incredibly helpful for debugging scripts. Incredibly helpful versus the old way of writing stuff out to the event log and hoping you wrote out enough information to be able to stop it. Now, the one other thing I want to show you, this is a tip I use in all my scripts, is, and I'm going to stop debugging. Oh, let me get all these windows closed. No, I don't want to debug. Let me stop the simulator. The other tip that I have that I want to show you is how I go about including these statements and making them only run when I want them to run. So to do that, let's just come out here to a different one that I pre-created, version 2, and look at the actual created XML file. And what you'll see is here's my script. Now the difference in this script and the other one, like I said, all this code's up on my blog, is I've just, all I did is I created a function called debug output. And I pass in one more parameter. Do you want to turn debug on, true or false? And then in my function down here, way down here, I say, if debugging is turned on, then write out that, that event, that event right up to that event log. And if you come up here and look at where this thing is called, it's just one more argument that I'm passing in, true. So you can make this, you can make this overridden. So you can turn on debugging. So you can basically only turn it on when you need it in production to help you solve your issues. Now, the other thing I want to show you, and this used to be a really cool demo in the Arthurian console. It, the, the Visual Studio kind of takes a little bit of my thunder with this demo is one of the other things people want to see a lot of, and you've probably seen blog posts on this as well, is how you make business rules, or how you make rules only run during business hours. And the reason I want to show this to you is because this leads us into our advanced topics talk, where we're going to start talking about how all these rules and modules are just made, or rules and monitors are just made up of different modules. Then we start getting into the, the guts of how SCOM works behind the scenes. But what we've got here is I've just created a log monitor or a log rule. Actually, what I created was if I right click and go to, go to add new item, what I created was an alert rule. So I want to throw an alert when I find the error message in my log file. And like I said, you work this thing from the bottom up. So I'm targeting operating system, I'm setting the name, I'm specifying um, the data source I want to use. And in this case, the data source I want to use is the application log, generic log, filtered event provider. And the reason I want to use the filtered event provider one is because that allows me to say I only care about these specific lines in the log file. 
again, you have to know the XML. And what this XML is saying is, all right, go to the Acme Logs directory, look for any log files that are in there. And if the line from the log file contains the word error, I care about that line. So do something. How do I get the line from the log file? Well, you access it by saying param slash param bracket one. That used to be, th when I first started doing this, I had to hunt to figure out how to do that because it's not very intuitive. But I'm accessing the, a line from the log file, and I'm checking it to see if it has the word error in it. Now, if it has the word error in it, I want to throw an alert. So I can give my alert a name, I can give my alert a description. But let's say I want to access that line from the log file in my alert message. How do I do that? Well, you've got to know the, per the, the parameter to put in here. And there's a couple of blog posts out there that list all these parameters. But in this case, to access that line, it's dollar sign data slash params slash param bracket one dollar sign. Oops. One dollar sign. Now, how did I know that if I haven't gone and read all these blog posts? Well, I'll show you how you pull that out in the MP simulator in just a second. But I want to add that into the alert. But here's the thing. I also only care about this thing running during business hours. Well, with a rule, one of the things you can add is what's called a condition detection module. And in this case, I have a schedule filter module, which allows me to filter to have things only run at a certain time. Unfortunately, just like with everything else, there is no GUI. In the Authoring console, there was one. So you have to know the XML. And in this case, what we're saying here is, um, I'm going to change that because that was for testing earlier. I want this to run from 8 AM to, say, 8 PM. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And that's not 8 PM. That would be 20. Thank you. <laughs> And what days of the week do I want to have it to run over? That's all documented in TechNet and MSDN. But it's a whole little count-up system that, that calculates it. But that's the number for making it run during the days of the week. So you have to kind of know the XML. You have to go do a little, a little looking to figure out what the XML value is that you're going to want. But by adding in a condition detection like that, that means that whenever this rule runs, it's only going to pass the data on if it's in that time period. So it's going to be monitoring that log file 24 hours a day. But if it's 8 PM to 8 AM, it's not going to do anything with the data. It's just going to throw it away. But if it's 8 AM to 8 PM, it is going to do something with the data. So let's save our changes here. And let's actually, so what we've done is we've taken just a basic rule and added in this condition detection module to make it a little more complex for what we want. So if we go to the Manager Pack browser and we drill down into our health model, and we go to our rules. We can see our rule. And we can say, let's run that in the MP simulator. And what that's going to do is it's got to build it first to make sure it builds correctly. So you can see the build is started down in the bottom left corner. And then we're going to actually be able to test this in the MP simulator and see it working. Now, while that's spinning up, Oh, wow, it's faster than I thought. I was going to jump ahead, but now I won't. But what this is leading us into is the fact that these rules, these monitors that we create, are just made up of these different modules. So let's run this in the MP simulator first. So I've got some target expressions that I could, I could set. I've got my management group that you know is just default generic values. And I'm going to start this simulation. So I am monitoring for that log file now. So if I come back out to, let me get where I want to go, Acme Logs, and I open up that log file. I got some other bad data in there. But this is, so we're going to say this is some good data. Now, here's the thing about log file monitoring that will come back to get you, because it got me at a client once. SCOM's not going to, your monitors, your log file monitors are not going to pick up a line of data until there's a carriage return line feed at the end. So you have to have a carriage return line feed at the end or it's not going to pick it up. But you'll notice over here in the simulator that the data source picked it up 
This is some good data. And look, the data item has a params section and then a param section. And this would be the first param section. So remember in our alert, we said data slash param slash param bracket one. That's how I know how to do that, because I'm drilling down through the XML to get that. Hmm? What do you mean, why isn't it zero? Oh, I have no idea why it's, why it's one base versus zero based. That's just how they did it. So, but then if we say this is an error and save that, then what we should see in a second is that it picks that up and the condition detection should run in addition if, we, if I've done everything correctly in this demo. It could take a moment for it, to, for it to pick up, and there you go. So now we can see, and I'm not sure why it runs twice, why it shows it twice, but it's showing the data that it's passing on to the condition detection. And then here's the data item that the condition detection, the event data, it's passing on to the alert. So then I could access all this information in the alert to pass on into the alert. But what the simulator is showing us is that it's working like we expected, and we don't have to import it into SCOM and wait for it to, to get pushed down and get, get H. Got to hold that. Hold your questions. I'm running out of time. Don't forget it. Write it down. So, so I could import this into SCOM if I wanted to. And in fact, I want to go ahead and import the one we did earlier because I want to show you something else that you need to be aware of when you start dealing with management packs. So obviously, if I'm going to import this, I can come over here to my administration console. And I can right click and I can say import management pack. And I'm going to add from disk. No, don't go find it. And we'll go down here to pre created and, and just import this one from earlier. And the reason I want to do that is because one of the other questions I get a lot of times from people is how do I know if the manager pack's actually been deployed? All right, we import it into SCOM. How do I know it's actually been pushed out to, to specific machines, the machines that I think it should have been pushed out to, so that I, I can tell for sure whether it's out there, so I can tell for sure whether, it's, you know, whether the discovery is working correctly or not. So the first thing we have to do is import this. Now, once it's imported, you can go to the machine where you expect to see it, and you can look in the event log. And there's two events that you want to look for. There's a 1201 event followed by a 1210 event. The 1201 event tells you, hey, I've received your management pack. The 1210 event says, um, hey, your management pack is loaded and ready to go. So you can see, here's my 1201 event. There's my Acme management pack. And then there's my 1210. So those are, those are events you're going to want to look for if you're trying to verify whether your management pack has actually been deployed or not. So let me do this. Let me close this solution. And let me open up another solution, and then we'll go back to the slides and talk for a second. So we're in the home stretch. Thanks for, thanks for sticking with me. Let's move on to some advanced tips and tricks that you need to be aware of. And to do that, we want to talk about some advanced authoring concepts at a high level. And then we want to talk about how you can build things like your own custom data sources, your own custom unit monitors, your own composite unit monitors that are specific unit monitors that do exactly what you want. And I'm also going to show you a trick for how you can build bulk collection rules. Who in here has had to build things like, I don't know, service monitors or perf collection rules? OK, I have. Um, how many, who in here has had to build like 300 of them? I've had to do that too. And it can take a while. I'm going to show you a tip, a, a trick that the authoring tools give you to get around that. So real quick, some of the advanced authoring concepts you need to be aware of. Everything is a workflow. And workflows are composed of one or more of these modules. A data source module, which gets the data. Probe actions, which also get the data. Condition detections, which are your if-then-else statements. And write actions, which do something, like throw an alert or write to the data warehouse, OK? So everything is made up of these. And there's rules that define how they go together. For example, a rule is made up of one or more data sources, 
zero or one condition detections, and one or more write actions. So that's why in the data source property window, we could add multiple data sources. In the write action, in the alert area, we could add multiple data, multiple information. And that's why in the condition detection, we could leave it blank or we could fill it out, but we could only add one. But the point is, you can mix and max these modules. You can put them together in the XML however you want to. And we've made some really complicated monitoring um, scenarios for people before. For example, this was a scenario. We need to monitor a log file. We need, and that log file has counters in it. And we need to trigger an alert when the counters go over a certain threshold, when specific counters. So this log file is, has, a, has lines of data full of counters, and we only want to trigger on specific counters. So what we have to be able to do is take that line from the log file and parse it. I can't do that with the generic log monitor. Can't do it. Can't parse it. And there's my date format that I want to use, right? Date, counter time, counter value. I can't parse it with the generic one. So how do you get around that? Oh, I know, I know. I'm going to write a script that's going to go read from the log file for me. What's the problem with that? Disk I.O. is slow, possibly. How do you keep track of where you are in that log file? Every time that monitor runs, how do you know, well, I was on line 5, now I need to move to line 6, now I need to move to line 7? It's hard. You could write to the registry, but it's a, it, it's a pain. The, the, the log reader in SCOM does it for you. So just the generic log reader in SCOM, it'll read through, it'll realize I stopped here, and it'll keep reading. It does it for you. So what I want to do is I want to mix and max these modules to where I let the generic log reader read the file, but then it passes it into a script for me that I can use to parse the file. So that, to do that, I created my own custom data source. And my custom data source was made up of this generic log reader, which reads the file, and then it passes each piece of data to my script, and then my script um, parses the file and outputs some information, which then I check to see, is this a counter that I care about? So this is where you start getting into some of the more advanced stuff. So let's go look at how that works. And what we actually did is I took that data source and used it in a rule, and then I wanted to make a monitor out of it, and I created a custom monitor out of that data source. And here's the reason why. Because by creating a custom data source, I've now got that script in one place. Rather than cutting and pasting that script into a whole bunch of rules, I've got that script in one place. Which means that if I ever need to update that script, what do I got to do? One place, as opposed to updating it in 20 places. So let's go look at what this looks like. Now, here we are in Visual Studio. And first, let me show you my script, because there's, there's another little key little tip here you want to you know about my script. So in my script, I'm creating my mom, my API object, which I need. And then I'm creating a property bag. So in a non-discovery type script, when you're dealing with rules or monitors, if that script needs to return data back to SCOM to do something with, you use property bags. A property bag is just a name value pair. It's all it is. So I create a property bag. And then I go out, and I, I'm passing in a line from the log file. And I'm passing in the counter that I care about, that I want to check for. So then it says, let me split the log file and get the different values from the log file. And if the line from the log file, the counter that's on that line, equals the counter name that I passed in, I care about it. So make a property bag called counter name and put that counter name in there. Make a property bag called counter value and put that counter value in there. So I'm taking that information, putting it in a property bag, passing it back up to SCOM so SCOM can do something else with it. And then I'm returning that property bag. Don't forget to return your property bag. If you don't return your property bag, you don't get any data and nothing's going to happen. So that's my script. Now to use my script, I had to create a custom data source. And I had to create a custom data source because I had to use the generic log reader data module and pass that data into my script. To create this custom data source, I don't have any help. I had to do it all in the XML. But I cheated. Would you like to know how I cheated? OK. 
So I cheated because I used the, the 2007 authoring console to create this data source for, code for me. And, by use, and then I just took the XML and copied it in here. Now, what I could now do is take this, make it a template, and then I could use this as a template for some of my other stuff. But what we've got is, I've got a type definition for my new custom data source. My new custom data source has these parameters. So all of these parameters are going to be, when I use this data source, I've got to pass all these parameters in there. The log file directory, the log file pattern, the counter name, the script name. But check this out. I'm also specifying what can be overridden. So if you ever noticed in SCOM when you create overrides, for some rules or monitors you have certain things that can be overridden, and for other, others you have different things, they're not always the same. That's because of how the data source was built. And this, in this data source I'm letting everything be overridden, but you can control if you build custom data sources what can be overridden. And then what I've got is, the first thing I've got that makes this up is the log file generic log reader. And I'm passing in those different parameters. So what's going to happen is, the generic log reader is going to trigger. It's going to get the first line from the file. Then my probe action happens. And what my probe action is, is it's a script property bag probe action. So it's expecting, prop it's going to output property bags. And what it does is it uses that script I showed you and passes in these values. You'll notice that I have data slash param slash param1. And I have that so that I can get the log file, the, the line from the log file. So I'm taking the line from the log file that was read in by this data source and passing it into my script. Now this is just a data source, and then the output is the property bag. So this is going to output either NA and a blank, or a counter name and a value if it finds that counter name and value in that file. So then what I did is I said, you know what? I'm going to create a custom rule that alerts off of this. So I came in and I said create an alert rule. And in my alert rule, we're targeting the operating system. And for my data source, I said use my custom log reader data source that I just created and pass in this information. So this is my actual alert rule that's going to look for that log, for that counter. And then I have a condition detection expression filter which says, hey, if I get this far, if the data source returns data, then I'm going to get some property bags. So I created a property bag expression that says, if the property bag that has that's set to name is counter name equals counter one, and its value is greater than 75, throw an alert. So I'm just building an alert rule at this point. So that's going to be an alert rule that I can use using this custom data source, which is going to keep track of where I am in the log file for me, and it's going to throw an alert whenever counter one is greater than 75. Now, I also decided, you know what? It would be really cool if I could use, make a monitor to monitor for this issue as well. So to do that, so I can create custom data sources. I can create custom condition detection rules. I can create custom probes. I can do all that kind of stuff. But I can also create my own composite unit monitors types, which are custom unit monitors. So in this case, I created a composite unit monitor type. Again, you have to know the XML. But this is a custom monitor type I created that has two states, healthy and critical. It expects this information to be passed in. So I'm, as part of this monitor, I'm actually letting you specify the counter name and the counter value that you want to use to trigger, to trigger it to go critical. And then I'm using my custom data source. And then I've got two expressions. I've got a healthy expression. So I'm healthy if my, counter if, if my value equals counter name and the property is less than whatever the threshold value. I've also got an un a critical expression, which would be if my property returned is equals a counter name and my counter value is greater than that value. And then I specify, you know, use this for healthy expression, use this for critical expression. But now what I've got is a composite unit monitor type that I've built, that I know how it works, 
Joe Blow that just wants to build a quick monitor using this doesn't have to know how it works. He can just build a quick monitor using it. Which I've done. I created a basic unit monitor. Where, again, I specified that my unit monitor for uses my custom log monitor type. So I show you all this, and I know it's just, we're just flying through all this, but I show you all this because this is some of the stuff, once you get comfortable building management packs, that's really freaking cool. That you, I mean, there's power here that you can really sink your teeth into. So I know that's a lot of heady stuff. So let's, let's take it back a little bit. Let's get, let's, get, let's get a little bit simpler, which is I need to build a whole bunch of perf collection counters all at once. All right? What's happened at a company? We needed to build, th they had a list of 300, 400 perf collection, collection count counters that they wanted collected. That could take a while to build, but check this out. So let me come out here and open up one more project. I want to show you something that the Visual Studio Tools allows you to do that makes this much, much simpler. Now remember, one of the things that Visual Studio Tools does for us is it auto generates, can auto generate code. So what I did is I created a, a, a snippet of code, a perf collection snippet of code. So this is the XML for a perf collection rule. Rule ID. Um, now, and all this stuff you see in, in, in highlighted in yellow, those are very, that's variable information that I can pass in. So I can pass in the text ID. I can pass in the counter I want to collect. I can pass in the instance I want to collect. Now, because I have this snippet of code, I can then use this template snippet, snippet to where all I have to do is fill out this little spreadsheet. You know, all I have to do is say, you know, ID2, counter2, object2, instant2, we're in this at 120. And then if I save this and I look at the auto-generated code, oh, I gave it a bad rule ID, but there's my auto-generated code. So by filling out this little spreadsheet, it quickly generates these counters. That's cool, right? I'm not having to write all this XML code. But check this out. Import from CSV file. Yeah, baby. All I have to do is have all that stuff in a CSV file in the right order, which won't take that long to build because I already had it. And then within 10 minutes, we had created their 300 perf collection rules. So again, look for the places where Visual Studio is going to help you from, from the automation standpoint to help you auto-generate that code. All right, so let's go back over here. I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. Stick with me. One more thing to talk about. Come on, catch up. So these are some of the stuff that it can take a while to grasp. Sometimes I still get a little confused on it sometimes. But there are two things that you hear about a lot. Well, one thing that you definitely hear about a lot, which is cook down. How many people in here have heard about cook down? OK, y'all haven't, but you do hear about it. So here's the thing with cook down. We're going to talk about cook down and on-demand detection. So let's just talk about an initial example. We've got a monitor that we've built, a custom monitor that's made up of these three things. It's a data source, simple, data, the data source is a simple scheduler, the probe is my custom probe, and the condition detection is my results filter. It's just a monitor, OK? I've got a second monitor that's made up of a custom data source that I created, oops, sorry, that I created, and then that custom data source passes information into that condition detection. So I've got two monitors right now. I've also got an alert rule. The alert rule also uses my custom data source. And then it's got a condition detection and a write action. So I've got two monitors and a rule. And then if we look at my custom data source, my custom data source is made up of simple scheduler, my custom probe, my results. 
So what's the first thing you notice? Anybody? The data source at the bottom looks exactly like the monitor at the top. And then both the second monitor and that rule are using the same, are using my custom data source. So what happens when SCOM imports this and starts trying to run it? For each workflow, it actually builds an execution chain. So it takes it and breaks it into its individual components. It breaks all the modules out to their root definitions and puts them in a chain just like this. So for each, so we've got my first monitor, my second monitor, and my third monitor. Then it starts analyzing the chain, analyzing each of those modules and analyzing the input parameters and hashes them all together. And if any of the module IDs match and the hash results that come back match, then this is what's called a candidate for cookdown. So what happens is, if you'll look here, these all, these all simple schedulers all in the same row, data source probes all in the same row, condition detections all in the same row. If the input parameters are all the same, then SCOM's going to go, you know what? If I run the first three modules in each of those, they're all going to return, each one would return the same data because it's the same input parameters, it's doing the same stuff. So SCOM gets smart and does what's called cooks them down. It only runs them once. And it runs them once and then flows that data into the, work, into the, into the workflows and the rest of the modules in that workflow. This can be very helpful when you've got, say, some rules, 30 or 40 different rules that all use some kind of script where that script returns the same data initially for the rest of the modules in that rule. You just run that script one time, pass the data on, as opposed to running it 30 times and passing the data on. Cookdowns, uh, you know, you got to get it in your head. You got to build for it to make it work. The other thing is the on-demand detection. How many people in here have seen the recalculate health button in Health Explorer? How many people have punched that and gone, what the heck? Thank you. You've got to build your custom rules or monitors to make that work. And it only works is if you start off your rule or monitor with a, with a probe module, not a data source module. So there's, there's some blog posts out there on on-demand detection, but one of, the things you, is, one of the things to remember is you've got to build it, your ruler monitor has to be built for it to work, and be careful, because if you say recalculate and you've got 30 instances or 50 instances of something that's recalculating on one host, it could go boom. So you want to be very careful from that standpoint. Now, this is all the stuff we've covered. We've covered a whole bunch of stuff. And like I said, all the demos are up on my, on my website. I got to give a big thank you to Matthew Long, whose blog you're going to see. You should go read his blog. He contributed a lot to this. But this is all that you learned. We covered all that stuff today. So I've got links for you in the slides. You can get these off the slides to my blog. Um, I blog at ALM Rocks. That way you can, that's where you can find the, the, what am I trying to say, the files. We've got the, the Arth, MP Arthuring blog. We've got the TechNet Wiki, all of great resources. And if you want to reach out to me, you can. Mickey.Gusay at InfrontConsulting.com. You can find me on Twitter. I, I do my best to always answer questions. I'll give you a card, whatever you want to do. And the last thing I want to tell you is please, please, please go fill out your evals. I know you hear that from every speaker, but you know what? This is the last session. You don't have to ever hear it again after me. But please, please, please go fill out your emails and please leave comments. Comments are what, I, are what I really care about. So please leave comments. I'd like to know what you liked or didn't like so I can make sure I do this better next time. And with that, I've got nothing else to, to tell you. You can come up and answer questions. We've only got a minute left, so they're going to turn the recording off. So if you want to come up and answer questions, I'll be glad to, to answer questions or whatever you want to do. Otherwise, thank you very much and have fun at the party tonight. Thank you.